Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be debunking Jonathan Riley from Real Talk, who is very confused about the Catholic Church and Catholic teachings, and he has a whole video on why Catholicism is false, but all the arguments that he makes are themselves false. He presents many erroneous and fallacious arguments against the Catholic Church which just aren't true. So in this video we're going to be playing his clips of what he says about the Catholic Church, and then showing what we actually believe and why what he says is not true. And we're going to do that right after this. Hello everyone and welcome to Catholic Truth, your place to know, love, and live the Catholic faith with purpose and passion and even be able to defend it. Check out our website at catholictruth.org. Jonathan Riley, I like him. He's passionate, but he's really wrong. <laughs> He's really off base in what he says about Catholicism. And so let's get started in seeing what he has to say. Catholics have a false savior. That's the Pope. Again, they look at him above everything else. They esteem him. They think he's sinless. They think he's the Holy Father. They think his words are equal to scripture. If you think I'm kidding, let's read that a second. Here's the first Vatican Council from 1870. And this is what it says, quote, should anyone which God forbid have the temerity to reject this definition of the Pope's infallibility, let them be anathema or accursed. So if you don't believe that the Pope is infallible, that his, his words are equal to scripture, if you don't believe that, you're damned. The first thing he says right off the bat is that Catholics think that the Pope is the savior. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. That doesn't even make sense to Catholic ears because we know that Jesus alone is the Savior. Jesus alone is the Lord. Jesus alone is our Redeemer and King. So I don't know where he gets the idea that the Pope is the Savior. And just so you don't have to take my word for it, as we're taking his word for it, here's what the Catholic Church has to say on the matter. Just real briefly, it says, The divine name Jesus alone brings salvation, and that's found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In the document, Jesus is our Savior, it says, As universal Savior, Christ is the only Savior. Three, Jesus is a perfect mediator who unites God and man, obtaining them the goods of salvation and eternal life. Four, Jesus merited life for us by his blood. Five, Jesus Christ, Son of God, is Lord and only Savior. And it goes on to say that he accomplished everything by his life, death, and resurrection. <laughs> Nothing about the Pope there. So whatever information he thinks he has or whatever sources he was reading, they're wrong because the official teaching of the Catholic Church is that Jesus alone is the Savior. This is a grievous mistake, and he confuses infallibility with impeccability. He thinks that infallibility means impeccability. Impeccability means a person is perfect and sinless. Infallibility does not. Has he ever heard of the Pope Alexander VI? Everybody knows Alexander VI as one of the worst popes in history. So no, the Pope is not sinless, and he goes to confession every week because even he knows that he is not sinless. Mr. Riley goes on to erroneously state that the Pope's words are equal to Scripture. Never, again, never in the 2,000-year history of the Catholic Church have we ever taught that because we don't believe that. That's like blasphemy. Only Scripture is Scripture, and we don't believe that any man's words are on par with Scripture. He goes on to read a quote about how the Pope is infallible and how the Catholic Church proclaimed papal infallibility, but then he goes on to make a conjecture, a false conjecture, that infallibility means the Pope's words are on par with Scripture, but that's not true. It's never been true. We don't believe that. They're not on par with Scripture, and in fact, the Catholic Church teaches the opposite. Listen to what the Church says. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether it's in written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the Church alone. Yet, this magisterium is not superior to the Word of God, but is its servant. It teaches only what has been handed on, unquote. And that comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 85 and 86. And what it's saying is that the Pope and the Magisterium, which is simply the teaching office of the Catholic Church, is the servant of the Word of God. We don't think we're over the Word of God. So the Catholic Church believes that we are started by Jesus, that Jesus gave the fullness of truth 
And he went on to give his disciples the Holy Spirit to the church. He gave his Holy Spirit to the church to guide it into what? All truth. Not some truth, all truth. Because they couldn't bear all things at that time. So Jesus was going to continually teach them things through the Holy Spirit and reveal things, although everything revealed was in the first century, the full deposit of faith, but they will come to understand it more. And so the Catholic Church believes that the Holy Spirit was sent to guide the church into understanding these things. The Pope, his word is not scripture. It's not on par with scripture, but we do believe that the Holy Spirit guides the church to understand what the scriptures mean because Jesus started the church and gave his authority to her. And in fact, it was the same authority that was given to the church that allowed the Catholic Church to authoritatively make the canon of scripture in the 5th century, starting in the 4th century, finalized in the 5th century. But it was the Catholic Church that made the canon of the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and therefore we have the authority to interpret it. Not that we can just make things up. The Pope can't just say, oh, you know, science is God now. And then all of a sudden, because he said it, it becomes true. No, just because the Pope says something does not make it true. And so, People have to learn that there's a lot of statements between the Pope's opinion all the way up to infallible statements. And even infallible statements, you know, the Pope can't speak on science and many other things. It's not, doesn't mean you can just say whatever you want and it becomes magically true. No, that's not how infallibility works. And we're going to be making a whole video explaining that. So we believe that the Catholic Church is authoritative and can speak for God and interpret things properly. Unlike Protestants, we don't believe that God gave the Holy Spirit in the same way to men, mere men, 1,500 to 2,000 years later, who broke away from Christ's church and who can't agree with each other on almost anything, even down to basic theology. For 500 years, the Protestants have been bickering and fighting with each other and can't even agree. Yeah, they condemn the Catholic Church, but they also condemn each other, and that says a lot about them. Lastly, he goes on to say that the Catholic Church calls Pope Father. Oh, how dare they? How dare they call him Holy Father? <laughs> and there's a good reason for this. And in fact, we made a whole video on are we allowed to call men Father, which we will link here if we remember. And if you don't see it pop up here, we will put it in the description section down below if you would like to know why this is biblical. They also believe that uh, the Pope is the head of the church. Again, Colossians 1 says that Jesus is the head of the church. They believe that the Pope can forgive sins. What does the Bible say about that, just really quickly? Mark chapter 2, verse 7, says that only God can forgive sins. 1 John 1, 9 says that we confess our sins to God, and he is faithful and just to forgive them. Not a Pope or a man in a box like they do in the Catholic Church. In this clip, he says that the Pope is the head of the church, according to Catholics, and not Jesus Christ. But again, the Catholic Church teaches precisely the opposite. Everything he's saying is literally the opposite of what we teach. And again, the reason I'm putting these quotes on the screen is so you don't have to take my word for it, but you can see that he is misrepresenting the Catholic Church, and what he states about the Catholic Church is just wrong. Let's see what the Catholic Church says. Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the principle of creation and redemption, raised to the Father's glory in everything, preeminent, especially in the church, through whom he extends his reign over all things. Wow, that is clear that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is preeminent, Jesus extends his reign, and Jesus is head, it says, over the church. How can the Catholic Church be more clear? The problem with Mr. Riley is he has only found selective quotes from other Protestants taken out of context that he's using for his own video, and he has not read the Catechism himself. He quotes it, but he's never read it. And maybe he's found a verse in the Catechism, a section which he thinks incriminates the Catholic Church, but he's being dishonest because he's not reading any context and he's not actually reading what we believe. This states precisely opposite of what he said. Do you remember in the book of Genesis, uh, chapters 35 to 50, with Joseph, he became the royal steward in Egypt, and he was the second in command under the Pharaoh, and he reported only to the Pharaoh because he had the highest authority in the land under Pharaoh. Now, this office was used by the Israelites, and the prime minister in Isaiah 22 had the highest authority in the land, and everyone reported to him, and he 
reported alone to the king, and he was subject to the king. This is the office that Jesus gave Peter by giving him the keys of the kingdom of heaven, just as their prime minister received the key of the kingdom of David. And these keys symbolize authority. But the point of me saying this is that Pharaoh was still in charge of Egypt. King David was still in charge of Israel, and Jesus is still head and king of his church. The Pope is not the head. He is the servant to the head. He's the servant of the king, put in charge by the king, will give an account of his actions to the king on judgment day. But he is not the head of the church. He might be the visible head that we can see, and the apostles and the Pope together are the the heads and the leaders of the church, but Jesus is the ultimate head of the church, and that's what the catechism and the teaching has always been of our church. Then he goes on to make a false dichotomy where he says that only God forgives sins. We believe that. The Catholic Church again has taught that. And so even if the Pope or the priests or the bishops hear confessions from people in a confessional or not, we believe that it's God who forgives the sin through the priest. It's not the priest who forgives our sins. It's God. And in fact, the Pope and all priests and bishops go to confession themselves, and God has to forgive them too because they are sinners. And this is where we get the teaching from John 20, 21 through 23, where Jesus gives his authority to the apostles to forgive sins. And even 1 Corinthians 5, 17 and 20 through 21, Paul says we received this ministry of reconciliation from Jesus himself. And so, we reconcile people back to God, he says. Now, we have a whole video on this, which we will link below if you're interested in seeing more uh, biblical information about it and why God set up the, the ministry of reconciliation and the sacrament of confession. I love how Protestants read their own tradition into the Bible and into history. And they do this really well. And they convince people falsely that what they're saying is true. He goes on to say that Catholics teach a false Mary because she was a virgin. But what he leaves out is that every Christian believed that Mary was a virgin unanimously for the first 1,500 years of the church, and even more so past that because the Protestant reformers all believed that Mary was a virgin. So all Christians believe that Mary was a virgin, and what he teaches is brand new. It's man-made. It was never heard in the history of the Christianity, but yet he's so sure that he's right because he doesn't know the Bible that well, and he definitely doesn't know history that well, and he has not made a deep dive into history to see what Christians have truly believed since the onset and the dawn of Christianity. He goes on to quote Mark chapter 6, which says that Jesus had brothers, but what he leaves out is that he's reading it in English, and it does not say that in Greek or Hebrew. One thing Mr. Riley would do well to remember is that Greek and English are different. <laughs> They're different languages. And Mr. Riley doesn't realize that, or maybe he does, perhaps, there are four different words in Greek for the one word love. We say love, and that could mean love for pizza, love for women, or love for a beautiful sunset. Oh, I love that sunset. I love pizza. I love my wife. I mean, we use it interchangeably for a lot of things, and it has different meanings. But in Greek, they have four different meanings for the word love, all the way from friendship love, filial love, and so on, up the line to unconditional love. So it's actually a lot more accurate. Likewise, in Greek, we use the word brother for actual brother. They use the word brother to mean brother, to mean uncle, to mean cousin, to mean best friend, nearest kinsman, nephew, and a whole variety of family relations. And you can see this in the Bible. And in fact, Abraham is called Lot's brother. But we find out later that he's actually Abraham's nephew. And there's a lot of examples of this in the book where there's extended familial relationships, but they're just called brother because that's how they did it. In fact, my, my friend, she was raised in a cult in China. And when she was thinking about becoming Catholic, she did not trust the Catholic church at all. And when I told her this, she's like, that's, that's just garbage. I don't believe that for a second. I was like, go talk to a Jewish rabbi. She said, fine, I will. And she did. She went to a Jewish rabbi and she came back and she said, you're right. <laughs> she said, "Whatever you, everything you said, the, the rabbi confirmed for me. And uh, I didn't believe you, but I do now. So if he reads it in Greek and Hebrew, it does not mean what he thinks it means in English. And if he looks at the history of the church, he's going to know that no historian or Christian in over 1,500 years accepted his personal interpretation of English in the Bible. Now, even many Protestant scholars 
admit this. And so I don't know where he's getting his information, except for that he seems to be looking down on a page and said, oh, it, look, look, it says it has brothers. Oh, he must have had brothers. Well, it also says to cut out your eye if it causes you to sin and cut off your hand. Do we just, oh, no, that's symbolic. Oh, well, why can that be symbolic? You know, like, they just, it doesn't make sense a lot of times. And they don't do a lot of deep dive into biblical exegesis. And that's the big problem with a lot of Protestant influencers today. In the next part, he goes on to say that Catholics bow before Mary and bow before statues, which isn't, which isn't true, and they kiss her feet and they flock to her. And he has all these assertions. They, he even goes on to say they worship her. Like, that's his assumption. We worship her. But just because we have statues doesn't mean we worship the statues. There were statues on the Ark of the Covenant, but the Jews didn't worship those statues. They used them for a specific purpose. And so do Catholics. In fact, in our church, it's just art. And in fact, up until recently, nine-tenths of the world's population couldn't read. And so we used art and architecture and stained glass windows and statues to tell stories about our brothers and sisters and the stories in the Gospels and so on. We used pictures to tell stories. Nothing to do with worshiping. That's Hinduism. <laughs> and I'm surrounded by Hindus in my area here in my town, and they actually believe their gods are in the statues. They freely confess to me that they worship statues and that they are idols and that they give them food and they dress them because they believe that they're serving the gods. Catholics believe no such nonsense. Statues are just statues made of plaster and marble. They're dead. They can't hear. They can't feel. They can't see. Nothing. In fact, he goes on to say that, well, you kiss them. Well, that's proof that you worship them. Well, really? Because I kiss my wife. <laughs> does that mean I worship my wife? Just because you kiss something does not mean you worship it. You have to have the intention of your heart to worship something. That's what worship actually means. You have to want to worship it as God or in place of God. I've even kissed pictures of my wife, and I have a whole video on TikTok where I kiss a picture of my wife. I said, this is a picture of my wife, and I kissed it. And I took a statue, and I kissed it. And I said, which one did I worship? Did I worship either of them, or did I worship both of them? Just because you kiss something does not mean you worship it. People kiss the ground when they get off the plane as a thank you. So glad. Thank you, God. I'm safe. You know, and they don't worship the ground. Although some people actually think that they're worshiping the ground. And I've heard that. It's just, it's nonsense. And he's extrapolating many things that he's reading into Catholicism that aren't actually there. And in fact, the Catholic Church condemns worshiping anyone or anything other than Jesus Christ. If you would like to know more information, we will put down in the description section two videos on statues. In this next section, Mr. Riley talks about worship and how Catholics worship Mary. And he tries to show how the word worship is found in a Vatican document and it's associated with Mary. And so therefore, Catholics admit freely that they worship Mary. But of course, he's grievously mistaken here on many levels. First, he doesn't understand what the word worship means. He doesn't seem to understand that there were many different definitions to the word worship. I mean, worship traditionally historically, down through the ages, not just in Christianity, but even in ancient Greek literature. It could mean anything from respect to honor to all the way up to worship and adoration as we understand it today. And what makes it even more interesting is that this worship respect and honor could be attributed to regular people or to deities, and they were always used even interchangeably. So you could talk about honor or worship for a, for a person, but of course it depends on the meaning that you have attached to it, or you could talk about it as honor or worship for God or a deity, and they were often used interchangeably, and there was a wide range all the way from respect to adoration, which is the highest. So this is just what the word meant. There were many different definitions within the word worship. It didn't mean what we mean or what Protestants mean it is today. Only worship, only adoration for God alone. Yes, that was part of it, but there were other ways as well. And this was seen throughout the Bible. There is different variations and uses of it in the Bible as well. So this is just how it was. And anyone who's over like 30 or 40 remembers this. In Old English, you would call a judge or a magistrate or a king your worship. Here in America, we would say your honor, you know, your honor, your honor. But in England or in Britain, they would say your worship. And they would say that to a judge. They would say it to a magistrate or even to a king. But they, they didn't mean that they were worshiping the king. It meant your honor. The same thing we meant. They were just using the word worship because the word worship and honor are used interchangeably even in our own language 
language. In Old English, that's what it's used, and it could be used for anything. Judge, magistrate, king. So it had nothing to do with worshiping the king. It had to do with honoring him, but they used the word worship. And it's the same thing with Mary in the documents, too. They're using the Old English. They're using the word worship in the sense of honor, not in the sense of adoration. And we know that because the Catholic Church specifically says in these documents and in the Catechism that worship and adoration adoration type worship is for God alone, whereas honor and respect is for Mary and the saints. But among the earliest Christians, they wanted to make a distinction uh, between the kind of honor that you give to people and the kind of honor that you give to God, because it was so interchangeable the the terms could be synonymous many times. And so they developed this language, which in Latin and in the church we call latria and dulia. Latria if you look up in the catechism or in Catholic documents, is adoration and worship given to God alone, who is supreme above all, over all, in all, God alone. But then there is dulia, which is just mere respect and veneration. And this dulia is given to Mary and the saints or just people in general, but specifically Mary and the saints. We honor them because of how they followed God. So now we have this distinction, latria and dulia and Hyperdulia, in fact, to Mary, we, we honor her in a special way. But the bottom line is we don't worship Mary. The Catholic Church condemns Mary worship. In fact, there was a heresy, I think it was in the 4th century, 5th century, called Coloridianism, and they did worship Mary, and the Catholic Church condemned them. He goes on to say that all one needs to do is take a quick search around the internet, and you'll see graven images and statues of Mary. But the reality is, all one needed to do is take a quick search around the Temple of Solomon, and you would see grave in images and statues everywhere. If you look at the Temple of Solomon, there were not only had statues, but they had graven images made of things in heaven and on earth, carved into the walls, carved into the doors throughout the temple. That doesn't mean these things were worshipped because they weren't. But God allowed them. See, what the Bible is prohibiting is worshiping statues, worshiping, creating idols to worship. If we're not against statues, though, I mean, there's statues of Martin Luther. There's statues of Martin Luther King. There's statues of Gandhi. There's statues of Galileo. There's statues of... Um, Karl Yastrzemski, like there's baseball players and other people who have had things in their honor, but they're not meant to be worshipped. And who greater to honor than the saints? And all the statues tell a story of their life. I mean, if you think about it, there's this that post, that meme that comes out around Christmas time, and it says Christmas time, that magical time when Protestants worship statues, and it has crashes and it has nativity scenes in Protestant churches or in front of Protestant homes where Protestants use statues at Christmas time. They have statues of Mary. They have statues of Joseph. They have statues of the baby Jesus and and uh, other animals and people like the shepherds and things like that. But of course, these are not worship, and too many Protestants conflate statues with worship. You can have a statue and not worship it. You can have a picture of something and not worship it. And that's where these Protestants, many of them, want to go astray. On TikTok, I made this funny um, post where it had a Protestant church bowing before the altar, and it said Protestants bow before an altar. They should only worship God, but look at them. They're worshiping a piece of wood. And I had hundreds of comments saying that the Protestants weren't worshiping a piece of wood. They weren't worshiping um, the altar itself. They were worshiping God. They were just bowing before the altar. They weren't bowing to the altar. And of course, I was just playing with them and all the Catholics were having a good old time. They were eating popcorn and watching this one because it was. I was saying, no, no, they're they're worshiping the, the, the altar. They're bowing to the altar. Altar. Look at them. They're bowed down right before the altar, and there's a cross behind it, probably. So they're bowing to a cross. They should only bow to the living God. And the Protestants were justifying themselves so hard. No, no, it was just an act of prayer, it was a posture of prayer. They weren't actually bowing down to the, the, the altar that happened to be there behind them. They're bowing to God. And they couldn't see the irony of what this is what Catholics do. This, and I was blaming them the same way they blame Catholics, just to help them to see the point. 
most of them couldn't until I'd made a follow-up video showing them this is what you do to Catholics and you don't ever give them the benefit of the doubt. We're not actually bowing to a statue or to an altar or to a cross or to anything else. It's a prayer posture where we bow before God and we don't bow to these things. We don't love these things. And here you can see from the pictures that you have hundreds of Protestants bowing before altars, hundreds of Protestants crying and bowing before tissue boxes and, you know, crying their eyes out all because they're worshiping altars and they're bowing before man-made things. But of course, we don't believe this. It's, just, it's silly. We know they're bowing to God. And we know they're worshiping God. And yet Catholics do the same thing. And they don't realize that. They're, people are too quick to say, look, you worship this, you worship this, because it's all around the internet. But we don't. And if anyone does worship a statue by chance, I'm sure there's some confused Catholics around the world somewhere who might bow before a statue or worship Mary in some way, but the Catholic Church condemns that. And that's what these people need to understand is that that's not a Catholic teaching. They need to be educated and instructed and taught better because they don't know better. That's not what the Catholic Church teaches. And in fact, it's what the Catholic Church condemns. He says people flock to statues. Really? Well, can you see those pictures we just posted? We have Protestants flocking to altars. Or were Protestants just flocking together to worship God? And there happened to be an altar there, and there happened to be a wooden cross there, and they weren't actually flocking to the cross. <laughs> nobody believes that, and nobody believes that the, the Catholics are flocking to us just to have a statue. No, we're flocking to prayer. We're flocking to worship God. There might be statues there. There might not be, but we worship God. He goes on to say that they light candles. Well, lots of people light candles. That doesn't Candles don't necessarily mean worship in the Catholic Church. Having candles, we have some on each side of the altar. We have one in front of the tabernacle. Candles represent Jesus as the light of the world, but they also symbolize our prayers rising up before God. We're not actually burning incense to statues like Hindus do, because that would be false worship. They believe she converts sinners. And if you think I'm kidding, let's go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It says, quote, taken up to heaven, she, being Mary, did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Think about that a second. Brings us the gifts of eternal salvation? <laughs> that sounds like the office of Christ. That sounds like what Jesus does, not what Mary does. But again, they hold Mary such in high esteem, it's almost like Mary's above Jesus. I can understand when this man is coming from in this section because he only quotes one sentence of the catechism, doesn't seem to understand church teaching, and doesn't look up any of the context. So, of course, he's going to think that. He probably didn't even read the catechism. He probably just found it on some other website and said, oh my gosh, Catholics worship Mary, look at this, and we're going to plant that here. And isn't that what atheists do? Atheists just find one thing that looks bad in the Bible. They don't bother looking up the context. They don't bother looking up whether it's true or not, what the historical meaning of it is. They just say, look, this is what God commands, and therefore God is evil. Or look, in the Old Testament, if someone didn't follow God and they were pregnant, God had them abort their babies. So therefore, abortion is okay. But when you look it up deeper, you realize that the opposite is true. He never commanded abortion, but they wouldn't know that just because it looks like that on the surface. But if you read the rest of the passage, it's not that at all. And that's what Protestants do. They act like atheists many times. And in fact, we have a whole video on how Protestants act like atheists with Trent Horn coming up in a couple of weeks. And they make a lot of literally like 12 of the same arguments they make the exact same way atheists do in the same dishonest way. And that's exactly what this man is doing. And he's dishonest about it. So if he understood what the church is saying, he, it's saying that we all help bring salvation to other people. But Mary did it in a special way because she alone brought salvation into this world. Jesus Christ came into the world through her. In other words, God chose her to participate in a special way. So she's always had a special grace with that. But we all do. I mean, if you think about it, we all help save people. If I ever say like, oh, Mary will, can save you or Mary will help save you, to Protestants, that's blasphemy. But the Bible says all the time that we help save each other. Paul says, you know, that I become all things to all people so that I may save some of you. And even James says that if you save a sinner from his ways, you will save his soul and your own. And listen to what Romans 10, 14 through 15 says. It says, how will they call on him 
who they have not believed in. How are they to believe in him if they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless we are sent? So how are people supposed to be saved except through us? We are the ones who are supposed to preach to them. We're supposed to help them to repent of their sins, to turn away from their sins, to see that they need a Savior, Jesus Christ, that they can't do it on their own. And we preach to them the gospel. And if they listen to us, they save their souls and they turn to Christ, they repent of their sins, and Christ saves them. But how did Christ do that? He uses us. He used us. Every time you preach to someone and they listen to you, you help save their soul. Anytime you leave a Bible tract or you give them a Bible quote and it changes their life and they turn to Christ, you saved their soul. Of course, it's all the work of Christ. It's his grace. He was working through you. It's all his work, but yet you were the instrument. And that's all the Catholic Church is saying, is that Mary and the saints can pray for us, even in heaven, and that Christ, in his great grace and power, can even work through them to save us. And they can continually help to save us through their prayers and through their intercession. Lastly, in this section, he quotes 1 Timothy 2.5, saying there's one mediator between us and God, and that's the man Jesus Christ. And he says, that's it. We go to the Lord. We don't go any other place. Really? So you don't ever ask anyone to pray for you. I find that hard to believe. You don't ever pray for anyone else. I find that hard to believe. The fact is Christians ask Christians to pray for each other all the time. So if you don't go anywhere else, by logic, this same logic, you can't ask anybody else to pray for you. Because every time you do, you're putting them between you and Jesus. Why don't you just go to Jesus straight by yourself? Why do you need to go ask a friend to pray for you? Why do you need to ask a pastor to pray for you? A family member to pray for you? Just go straight to Jesus. This is the same argumentation of logic that they give to Catholics. We do go straight to Jesus, but we also ask friends, family, pastors, and people in heaven to pray for us, and they all go to Jesus, and Jesus, the perfect mediator, takes it all perfectly to the Father. Number three, they have a false gospel. Please understand that. They have what is called grace plus works, okay? For Catholics to be saved, you have to do a ton of things, you know? Clearly what Jesus did on the cross was not enough. You have to add your efforts, your you know, things that you do, your works to what Jesus did, and then you're good. I want you to look at this, this uh, uh, graphic that I have up on the screen right now. This is Catholic salvation, according to Catholics, versus Christian biblical salvation in God's word. Do you notice something right off the bat? Do you notice under the Catholic side, there's no Bible verse that backs it up? <laughs> I find this section kind of funny because he has this post, this meme, where it says Catholicism, Catholic salvation, and then the Bible. And then he has the audacity to say, did you notice something? Did you notice what was on the Catholic side? No Bible quotes to back it up. That's because, Mr. Riley, it was made by a Protestant. Of course, they're not going to put Bible quotes on the Catholic side because it was made by a Protestant. Catholics know more than just a few pre-programmed, memorized verses, and we understand that these things are biblical. And if the Catholic Church or a Catholic like, oh, myself, made a picture like this, it would look something like this. As you can see from this picture, there are many Bible verses that talk about the necessity of good works, the necessity of almsgiving, the necessity of baptism and prayer, and so on. And we, these are all biblical. And I could have provided many, many more biblical passages. And this man says that you don't have to do anything. You just believe. Once you believe, you can't do anything else. And Christ saves you. Really? So let me get this straight. You just believe in Christ. I just have to say, okay, Jesus, I believe in you. And then I can sit on the couch and go to heaven. I don't have to read the Bible. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to pray. Like this guy had prayer on there <laughs> as something that Catholics do for salvation. So we don't have to pray to Jesus. Do we have to, we don't have to do anything. Apparently you just sit on your couch and you're saved. This is the kind of silliness that modern Protestants, who even are big influencers online, are teaching. That you just believe and there's nothing else you need to do, which of course is false. And this meme that I posted shows it, shows it's false. The Bible itself says in Acts 2.38 that you need to repent of your sins. 
You need to repent. Repentance is part of that. So you don't just believe. You need to repent. You also need to be baptized, it says. You also need to live out your faith, and you need to stay faithful until the end. You don't just believe. Sit on a couch and do nothing. I mean, go ahead. Just believe. Even the devil believes. That's what James says in James 2.19. It says, even the devil believes. So no, Mr. Riley, you don't just need to believe, and that's not all you need to do. See, Protestants in the last like two decades have become so... I don't even know, shallow in their biblical exegesis. And they've become so extreme that, that they're so like afraid of being like Catholic that they say, oh, we don't want to do stuff because then we'll be like Catholics. So they go to the opposite extreme as opposed to like traditional reformers who said, yeah, you still have to do good works. Yes, you still have to be baptized. Yes, these are necessary for salvation. But it's not those things that saves you. It's faith in Christ, which we agree with. It is faith in Christ that saves you. But we also need to obey Christ. But these people are saying, no, you don't need to do anything. That's what he said. You don't need to do anything. Then people say you don't need to add anything to Christ's work. Well, we can't add anything to Christ's work. And we're not adding anything to Christ's work by doing these things. We're doing these things because Christ told us to. <laughs> he commanded that we do these things. We don't repent to add to Christ's work. We don't get baptized to add to Christ's work. We do it because Jesus said to in Matthew, Mark 16, 16, and 1 Peter 3, 21, and Acts 2, 38, and Romans 6, 1 through 11, and many, many other verses. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. It is the free gift of God so that no one may boast. Do you see that? No works involved. You don't have to do it. How do you receive the gift of salvation? Through faith alone. That is it. Ah, yes. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, the Protestants' favorite verse. They love to quote these verses. And it's the one that's probably most quoted by Protestants against Catholics when it comes to salvation. Ephesians 8 through 9, we are saved by grace through faith, which has been a Catholic teaching for 2,000 years, FYI. And they say this is all you need. You don't need to have works. That's just it. Just faith, no works, except the passage does not say that. They take it out of context of the passage and they take it out of context of the entire New Testament. What the passage is actually saying and what it's talking about is that when we first come to Christ, it's talking about initial salvation, initial justification. When we're pagans and we first come to Christ, we believe in him and we put our faith in him and we come to him. He forgives our sins. He makes us new. He makes us a new creation, cuts off our past and makes us children of God. That's what happens when we come to Christ for the first time and put our trust in him and ask him to save us. And he does. We can't earn that grace. We can't earn salvation. We can't get that redemption, that renewal, that new life on our own. That is nothing we could ever do by our good works or by our own merits. It's all his work. That is what Paul is saying, is that it's Christ's grace and it's his work and it comes through faith, not of ourselves. And the Catholic Church teaches exactly that in the Council of Trent. In fact, the Council of Trent says if a man thinks that he can achieve this justification by his own merits or his own works, let him be anathema. So the Catholic Church has literally been teaching this longer than Protestantism has been around. <laughs> Protestants notoriously leave out verse 10, which says that we must walk in the good works that God has prepared for us to walk in ahead of time. Now notice, he distinguishes between works and good works. Protestants see works in the Bible and they think it means good works. But Paul almost always makes a distinction between works, which is like our own works or works of the law, Romans 3.28, uh, Abraham in uh, Romans 4, 5, and in other verses, Galatians 5, he talks about works, but he's talking about works of the law, like the rituals, the washing of the cups, circumcision, and things like that. Like Protestants notoriously quote Romans chapter 4 to show that we are saved by faith apart from works. But you know what the works Paul mentions in there are? The Jewish works, like circumcision, which is why he mentions circumcision nine times in that one passage, because that is the work that doesn't save us. And Jews thought they were saved by their works, by being Jewish, by just being part of the covenant, by circumcision. They didn't think that, I mean, that's why I thought the whole fiasco was in Acts chapter 15 is the Jews were trying to get the new Christians to be circumcised because they thought that that was necessary for salvation. And Paul was saying, no, that work 
is not necessary for salvation. Faith is necessary for salvation, not circumcision or any of the other Jewish rituals or laws. But this is different than good works, which Paul mentions in verse 10, which he says God prepared for us ahead of time to walk in. Now, what if we don't walk in the good works that God prepared for us to walk in? We're not going to be saved. That's why James says in verses 19 to 26 of his God of his letter, James chapter 2, he says that faith without works is dead, just as a body without a soul is dead. So your faith, if it does not have works, is dead and does not save you. He says, if you have faith but do not have works, can your faith save you? And of course, the answer is no. And he actually quotes Abraham there. Same verse Paul does, Genesis 15, 6. But he said that he was justified by offering Isaac on the altar and says that his faith was completed by work and his faith and works were walking side by side together. That's what the Catholic Church believes in a working faith. A faith, faith saves, but it's not an empty faith that doesn't do anything like Mr. Riley seems to imply. It's a faith that lives itself out in love for Christ by his grace and out of love for him. Moreover, Paul says we need works and other verses like good works that we actually are obedient to Christ and follow him. If you look in Romans 2 verses 6 through 7, Paul says that on the day of judgment, God will render to each man according to his works, eternal life to those who patient continue in good works, seeking the glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul who does evil, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. But honor, glory, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and then the Greek. So that is what he's like. Paul makes distinctions between different kinds of works, works of the law and good works. And the works mentioned in Ephesians chapter two are not, they're not good works because Paul distinguishes between works and good works. He puts them both in the same gospel passage, verse eight and verse 10, works, good works. He's not condemning good works, but Protestants think that he is just because they see works and they've just, they just, I don't know, have done that for so long, they don't even read deeper. The Bible is so clear that we must live for Christ. We have to live for him. And if we don't, we are not going to be saved. We can't just go sin and live any way we want. Or the Bible says we will be cut off from Christ. Hebrews 10, 28 says, if you continue to sin deliberately after knowing Christ and his grace, then you will be cut off and you have no sacrifice of Christ remaining for you anymore. Likewise, Romans eleven sixteen 16 through 22 says, if you don't keep being obedient to Christ. I mean, the Jews were cut off because of their lack of faith and their disobedience. And so if we don't continue in his kindness and we proceed in disobedience also, we too will be cut off from Christ. The Bible is so clear. In fact, um, Revelation 3, 5 says your name can be blotted out from the book of life. So if we don't stay faithful, we will lose our salvation. And there are like a hundred passages that prove that. Please understand this, you guys. You got to see this. Mass the practice of going to mass by by uh, Catholics is unbiblical. The Eucharist is unbiblical. If you look at almost every cross in a Catholic church, did you notice who's still on it? Jesus. He's still on there hanging on the cross. They're crucifying him over and over again. They don't believe that what he did paid for it one time for all. Oh, what do you say to people like this? He says that the Mass is unbiblical. The Eucharist is unbiblical. Catholics crucify Jesus at every Mass. They kill him over and over and over again. What do you say to a man who claims to be educated and is presenting shallow, juvenile, and uneducated arguments? He hasn't done any research. And we've made so many videos from Mike Gendron, like a former Catholic, to other people who say that Jesus is crucified over and over and over again every Mass. And we've put so many quotes up on the screens showing literally that the Catholic Church condemns that and teaches the opposite. And yet Protestants continue to repeat this myth over and over and over again. Jesus can't die again. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 that he died once and for all. And in the Catholic uh, Catechism and in the councils, the Catholic Church quotes these passages from Hebrews 9 saying that he died once and for all and can't die again. And the reason we have Jesus on the cross is to remember what he did for us. The cross was a generic torture device. Thousands, millions perhaps were crucified on crosses. But 
none of them meant anything. The only one that means something and that took on significance is the one with Jesus' corpse on it because he purchased our salvation by dying on the cross for us. So that is why we have him on a cross, to remember what he did for us, to remember his love and his salvation and how we can't attain salvation without his cross, his body and blood, his passion and what he did for us. Likewise, we also have crosses without Jesus on them. We also have crosses with Jesus like this, risen from the dead in power and glory. So we have many different types of crosses. We don't just keep Jesus on the cross because we don't believe that he didn't pay at all. That's just a mockery. This is this man's ignorance speaking. We keep Jesus on the cross because of his love, not because we don't believe he paid it all. There's a thousand passages in all the Bible. Just read something, Mr. Riley. Seriously, do some research and you'll see that the Catholic Church teaches that Jesus' salvation was not only enough, but the Council of Trent said it was super abundant, meaning it was more than enough to atone for all of the sins of the world. I didn't even talk about all of the objections that he had. He had more on purgatory, which is such a poor understanding. He doesn't even understand the Catholic teaching of purgatory. He hasn't even opened the Bible. He might say, oh, what is purgatory? He didn't even open this book to maybe get a basic definition of what purgatory is. He didn't do any research before condemning the Catholic Church. So we just... We've made videos on purgatory. We have two, which we'll link below if you want to know what Catholics actually teach on purgatory, not what Mr. Riley says. We also have five videos, six videos on Mary and answering objections to Mary, her perpetual virginity and that sort of thing. Since he said Mary wasn't a virgin, we prove it from the Bible and history. And you can see that down below as well. But I really hope this video helped to show that some people are maybe sincere, but they're really just sincerely confused or sincerely wrong and ignorant. They, they mean well, but they haven't put in the proper research. And we pray for Jonathan Riley. We pray for his, his ministry that he can become more intellectually honest. And we literally will pray for him. We have prayed for him. We will pray for him because we sincerely hope that they come to the truth. And we do these videos so people can see what people say about the Catholic Church isn't always true. What they say and what we believe are almost always two completely different things. And we put so many quotes up on the screen so you can see that it's not our opinion, but what the Catholic Church teaches and has taught for the 2,000 years comes from the Bible and from history. So please do us a favor and please, please Catholics everywhere, share this video with people, put it on your social media platforms, and please leave a comment down below so that more people can interact with it and more people will see it and we can get the truth of Catholicism out there. Just there's so many lies and there's not enough time to make videos like like this. So please, if you could support our ministry, uh, $10 a month, $25, $50, $100 a month, so we can really do full-time this work that we need to do and undo all of these lies with videos on our YouTube channel and podcast and TikTok and Instagram and so many more. It's what we're here for. We are Catholic truth, and we are here to preach the Catholic truth, the one truth that comes down to us from Jesus Christ our Lord. Check out our website at catholictruth.org. God bless you.